Okay, right. Thanks, everyone. And welcome to week six of OLS 6. Um, so we're delighted today. We're going to be talking about different use cases uh, and ways that people work openly within their science. And we have several different um, examples of use cases. Uh, we, we will be covering software, hardware and research data management today. Uh, I'm going to do a few of the quick uh, housekeeping kickoff notes that we do before we actually go straight into the talks. So um, first of all, the first reminder is that OLS has a code of conduct. Uh, and what this means is that we ask everyone who is participating in the OLS environment or representing OLS to um, treat one another with respect in the way that you'd like other people to treat you. Uh, there's always more to it than in a code of conduct than something that's short. Uh, we can't read it the full thing out every time, but if you want to look right now on the etherpad, it's line 68, and you can click right through there and see a hyperlink to um, the code of conduct. And if at any point you either witness or experience something that isn't actually in line with the OLS code of conduct that's uh, within the OLS purview, then please do contact us. You can contact team at openlifesci.org. That is the um, group email which reaches all of the organizers, which is Berenice, Malvika, Emmy, myself, and Paz. If you don't want to reach out to the full group, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just laughing at the captions because it's turned Berenice into Baroness, which, um, yeah, okay. I'm going to let myself not get distracted by the captions and continue and just say, yeah, if you need to report an, a code of conduct problem at any point to an individual, then our email addresses are on line 70 of the etherpad right now. Um, so we have otto.ai, that, that tr transcript, um, which is part of what was distracting me, <laughs> is uh, designed to help people participate. For example, if I'm speaking too fast or if someone's hard of hearing, or perhaps you're in a room and you can't be loud. And so you need to just follow along the transcript instead. And so to view that for me on the top left of the screen where it says live Otter AI, click here to open live transcript. You can click on that and then you should be able to view the stream live on Otter AI. Um, Otter AI does not work in breakout rooms. So we ask that people choose to have either written or spoken breakout rooms. Um, and the easiest way for us to sort people into breakout rooms is by asking you to edit your Zoom name and add W or S in front of your name. Uh, so W is for written and S is for spoken um, to indicate your preferences. So right now, if I wanted to say that I preferred a written breakout room in Zoom, I would click on participants. And then beside my name, I would click on more and I'll click on rename. And then I'm going to say I prefer written, so I'll put W in front of my name. And I'll just ask that everyone else do the same now. I'll um, pause briefly. If you're struggling to do it for some reason, we can always help rename you. Um, just message one of the organizers, that's myself, uh, or Pauline, or Berenice at the moment, to, um, to, to, to help with the renaming. We look like we're mostly done. That was really speedy. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, oh, and Nina, I can see that you are able to hear us now because your name has changed as well. Fantastic. Really glad. <laughs> okay, right. Um, I think those are all the basic intro bits. Just checking my agenda on my other screen. Um, so I think, Pauline, you're introducing the first talk. Do you want to uh, take it away? Checking, Pauline, are you here in case you are? Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Had trouble unmuting. All right, so our first speaker is Sarah Pitti, and she's going to be. Am I audible, by the way? Hello? Yes, you are audible. You're perfect. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Uh, our first speaker is Sarah Pitti, and she's going to be speaking about managing and developing uh, research data. And she is the um, data community manager for um, International Network Lead friction free, uh, and uh, frictionless data. Um, yeah, and Sarah, take it away. 
thanks, Pauline. Uh, let me just try to share my screen. One second. Okay. Wait. Sorry. <laughs> No worries. Okay. I think you can see it now. I'll pass in slideshow. Sorry, it's at the beginning. Sorry for the spoiler. <laughs> um, okay, I'll get started. So as Pauline said, uh, I'm going to present today managing and developing research data. Um, before doing so, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Sara Petti. I'm, as Pauline said, the International Network Lead and the Frictionless Data Community Manager at Open Knowledge Foundation, big lover of the open movement and based in Bologna, Italy, which is home to the oldest university in the world, I lately learned. Um, so before we deep dive into this presentation, I wanted you um, to, to take you through this research data life cycle and to think about it a little bit with me. Um, so um, we all know that the research data like goes through many different phases. We'll start with a collection of data. Then once the data is collected, we'll start to process it. Uh, we'll clean the data. Then once that's done, we can do the analyze of the data. And then after that, if we have some findings, we can publish the data, possibly archive it, possibly in a place that it can be easily findable by other people and possibly reuse it as well. And once the data can be reused, it means that this life cycle stays um, open. And it's very, very important if we want for innovation and insight to thrive, to make further scientific discovery, that this data life cycle stays a cycle and it doesn't, and it doesn't become a line with a starting point and an ending point. And that's something that I really want all of us to bear in mind. Um, and we're going to go through some tips uh, and things that we'll have to consider to make sure that our data stays in a life cycle. So the first thing, of course, to make sure that this cycle is not broken is that the data that we share is shared openly. And we probably all know this, but I put here the open definition by the Open Knowledge Foundation to explain what open means. So open means that anyone can freely access, use, modify, and share for any purpose, a data or a content that we're sharing. Um, I encourage you to go and read the full open definition if you want to. And I put here also a resource uh, that might be helpful, which is the Open Data Handbook, also created by the Open Knowledge Foundation, which is a guide with uh, some guidelines, use cases that will help you to basically make your data more open. Um, now, um, Sadly, open does not always mean that uh, the data or the content is accessible. And now I put here a quote that a colleague of mine shared with us a couple of months ago, and I'm going to read it aloud for you. It's from the Open Data Barometer, and it's about government data, but I think it's applicable probably with other percentage to any kind of data. And it says that we found that only 7% of data is fully open, only one of every two data sets is machine readable, and only one in four data sets has an open license. Now, we can see that although this data is sometimes shared openly, it, the fact that it's open, it doesn't mean, for example, that the data is understandable because it's not machine readable, which means that I cannot directly use this data. And then um, the other thing is also that if the data is not shared with an open license, it means that possibly the data is not accessible. And worst even, if the data is not shared with any license, then if I see the data, I don't really know what I can do with it. Now, um, so open data, as I said, is not enough, and data must also be fair. So those are the principles that data must be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable too. And I put a little resource uh, down here, which can be useful for you. Uh, it's a fair checker that you can use basically to assess the fairness of your data. Um, and I encourage you to go and have a look if you want. But one thing that I want everyone here to be aware, as I said before, that open data is not always fair data. At the same time, fed data does not always need to be open. Um, so something to keep in mind. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go into like different steps that we have to be careful of if we want our data to be fair. The first one is of course, put a license on your data. And 
any kind of different content will need a different license. Uh, so for example, if you are trying to share content or if you're trying to share data, for example, maybe a Creative Commons uh, license is a good choice. If you're trying to share code, maybe a FOSS license is probably better. But the idea is basically that we have three types of open licenses, or if you want three levels of license. So there's a public domain license, which means that basically anyone can take your data and use it for anything that they want. Um, then there is an attribution license, which means that, yeah, people can still use your data in any way that they want, but they need to attribute it to you. Uh, and then the third level is an attribution license with a share alike, which means that if I use your data to develop a further analysis, then I'll need to share that analysis in the same way that I shared, that I shared my data in the first place. Um, one thing that could be uh, tricky a little bit is that although you may be the one collecting the data, you're not always the owner of the data. Uh, so I encourage you to go and check with your institutions or publisher, because if you have a university affiliation, maybe the university is actually the owner of your data. If you're publishing your data in a journal, maybe you're passing the ownership to them. So check if you're the one that can really choose the license for your data. And if you're in doubt, just go and ask your librarian who can surely help you. And here, if you are undecided where, on which license you want to use, I put a couple of resources that might be helpful. The first one is an article about open licensing from the ODI. Um, it's a bit wordy, but I find it really interesting. And the second one is just the license guide of Creative Commons, uh, if you decide to go for one of those. Second step, uh, always, always, always remember to share your data with metadata. So metadata, we all know, is data about the data. Um, and basically, when I share my data with metadata, it means that the person that receives it, in principle, should be able to use it without having to ask me any question at all. And metadata, notably, allows people to, allow people to answer some of the questions that you see here. So for example, how was the raw data collected? How was the analysis done? What do the column names mean? What are the data types on the columns? Who created the data in the first place? What is the license on the data? And how can I assess the data quality? Um, one thing that I really want to stress here is uh, the importance to always document your work. And I know that sometimes, especially like in the beginning of a research career, um, it might seem a bit bulky or a bit formal to put documentation uh, on the work that you do. But I encourage you not only to think about other people that may use your work in, in a second moment, but also about yourself who might want to take a peek at that work maybe a couple of years later, and maybe you don't remember anymore how to answer some of those questions. So yeah, always, always remember to document your work. Um, the other important thing uh, to ensure fairness uh, of your data is to use data standards and possibly open data standards. And standards are basically a set of agreed requirements on how you have to share data and metadata and make it publicly available. The objective of standards is basically just to make it really easy to understand what is described in a data set and how it is described. And how it shows, how this little cartoon that I put here shows, um, if you use open data standards, it means generally that your data is much more interoperable. Um, another thing that I want uh, to bring your attention to is to remember to publish in non-proprietary formats. And that's something people don't always think about because maybe, you know, you publish your data in Excel and everyone has Excel. Uh, but that's not always the case. Um, and you always have to remember that if you publish in a proprietary file format, it means that the person that then wants to reuse your data will need to have the proper version of that software as well. And as I said, that's not always the case. If you publish your data instead of Excel in CSV, for example, it means that your data is more interoperable because people with Excel can use it, but also people with other pieces of software can use it as well. And so, Publishing in open formats, it means that your data is more usable for years to come. Um, last bit is about publishing the data in an easily findable repository. Um, and I know that for some scientific fields, you don't have to make that choice uh, because you already have one or another repository that you use. Uh, but in case you do have to make that choice, um, I put here like some points maybe to consider if you want to uh, pick one repository over another one. And basically, is remember to check the conditions of the use of the data, including the kind of licenses that are allowed on the particular repository. Uh, what are the types and the formats of data that are acceptable? Um, 
what are the options for depositing different versions of a data set? And last but not least, remember to check um, what are the guarantees that that repository um, offers when it comes to archiving your data and long-term access. So in a nutshell, that was uh, like the main tips that I would have uh, for research data management. But now uh, I know that we don't have a lot, a lot of time, uh, but I just wanted to give you a quick example on how you can use frictionless data. So the project I work on uh, at Open Knowledge Foundation to create a reproducible data workflow. Um, so just as a brief explanation, frictionless data is an open source project with open code, some data and metadata standards, some software tool to build, to build uh, data pipelines and a community around it because of course it's an open source project. The main aim of frictionless data is basically to allow people to move to take research data and move it faster uh, from one platform to the other, but also to get inside, inside faster. Um, and here, I just put some of the functions that we're gonna briefly look into uh, of frictionless that people may, may use to build uh, reproducible data workflows. And so the first one is the data package, which is the core standard from frictionless data. Um, the idea is very simple. It's basically that before, um, sharing my data if I want to send my data for example to Pauline what I will do is that I will put it in a sort of like container that will contain my data but also a descriptor with like metadata and schema so that when Pauline takes my data package she can directly work on it um, without having to ask me any of the questions that we saw before um, so once that's it, that's done the other thing that frictionless can be useful for is basically you can use the software tools and particularly here I'm using the um, uh, the Python framework to describe and extract data. And that will basically, Frictionless will help me create metadata and schemas for my, for my data. So here we have an example of a JSON file, for example, which is um, machine readable, so directly usable. Um, and then once I have, so the metadata, so the data about the data and the schema, which is basically describing the structure and the data field of my data set, I can use that with Frictionless still to validate my data and to check for errors. Um, so using that schema, frictionless data will tell me, oh, here, look, for example, uh, here I put a dummy data set inside, um, but it will tell me like, oh, look, pay attention. Here there's a blank label and here there's a dupl duplicate label. So I can immediately see my errors, the errors in my data sets, and I can directly proceed into cleaning it. And that's the first, the last step that I wanted to show you from frictionless data, which is the transform. Um, transform function um, which will help me basically document all the cleaning steps that I will take um, and create a sort of like human and machine readable cleaning steps. So here it's a screenshot that I took from one of our pilots from Bicodemo and you can see that the user here so uploaded um, a file and then basically they replaced for example here the time, they converted something to decimal degrees, uh, here they converted a date into another format and the idea behind it is basically, again, if I'm sharing my data, people can directly understand um, what exactly happened and how the data um, was transformed from raw data to clean data. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, I encourage you, if you want to have a look and understand a bit more about frictionless data, to visit our website or join our community on Slack or Matrix if you're more into open source stuff. Um, I also encourage you to go and have a look at the Open Knowledge Foundation website, uh, follow us on Twitter if you want, on Frictionless Data or OKFN, and if you have any questions or anything, you're very welcome to drop me an email uh, or send me a direct message on Twitter. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I hope this was useful. Um, and yeah, it was a true honor. And let's have maybe some discussion if there's still time. Um. Maybe one question, there's one question on the on the EPA part. Um, do you have to go to platforms to share or host an open data repo? Sorry, I didn't get that. Can you repeat the question? Uh, this person asked, do you have to go to platforms uh, to share or host an open data repo? Um, oh, sorry. Um, well, for example, I don't know, Zenodo, for example, it's a good example. Um, you want maybe to explore um, 
depending on your fields. For example, Bicodemo is a good example. It's a repository that it's used in uh, uh, data management for oceanography. Um, I know that, for example, in in other fields they use they use other repository. I think you really need to explore what is used in your in your field. But Zenodo is a common one that is widely used. I would say. Thanks. Thanks for the question. I'll hand it over back to you. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Thanks. Thank it was so a real much. pleasure. It was a real pleasure, and I hope this was helpful. Really helpful. Can we just have a huge round of um, applause for Sarah? Um, and also thank you, Pauline, for um, hosting the questions and introducing. Excellent. And I, I have to say that um, after I get off this call, I am about to hop off and do some code. Um, which involves lots of data tidying and I'm thinking hmm yeah I should I should I should maybe be frictionlessing uh, so so this couldn't be more timely um, talking about code though uh, Luis I believe that our very next speaker up is also going to be teaching me things that I should know from my coding session after this A little bit more of a, a little bit of personal experience and a mix of of a way of seeing things rather than particularly particular techniques or methods. So I'm talking about open source software in science, and you know, and, you know, and in some sense, you know, I'm using you know, I'm using Linux, I'm using Google Chrome. These are all open source tools, but this is not what I this is not what we talk about. You know, when we, when we talk about open source software in science, is about software that's developed for science often by scientists and so and maybe in this context i'm just going to present myself because that's that's me so i'm actually i'm a computational biologist i work on the microbiome and mo most of my work is actually more biologically driven rather than developing tools per se but we've developed several tools and you know and and here this spans my career from being a phd student to now having you know, being a PI in a group. Um, and here you have several of our tools. And to some extent, it doesn't, it doesn't matter exactly what they do. Um, but so here, for example, this one, this means the first commit on, on Git. Um, then eventually we released. So that's the next little circle. And eventually we wrote a manuscript. But one of the points that I want to make is that even after it, after a manuscript is released on a tool, work doesn't stop. You know, when you publish a paper with scientific results, you know, once the paper is out, typically that's it. I mean, you know, maybe you know, maybe you do a follow-up work, but that will be a different paper. Whereas with the tool, um, things keep. So, for example, this tool here, there was a release earlier this year, and that's because you know, an updated version of Python. There's a small incompatibility. So we had to go, um, and it's a very minor thing, but you know, someone in this case, me, had to go um, and do that. So and also, I actually I was doing open source software before I was doing science. So I, I was doing open source software in 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 my undergraduate as a computer scientist, and and this is a little bit of the ethos that I I brought into science. So. One important thing, and I think especially if if you're starting out, um, is is to think that you're gonna you're gonna be hearing a lot about all of these things. You you hear, um, you know, you hear about you know there's there's a lot of version control which can get really fancy. There's you can add all of this automation, all of this support infrastructure, and it can be a little bit overwhelming. And one one of the things um, I, I talk about in my own group is that we actually we actually want to distinguish between at least three different types of code that we produce. So one is the things you know this is the one-off analysis. You know, we, I do something to show at a group meeting, or for example, I did some plots you know earlier to just to put in this presentation. You know, and I I didn't really document it or designed it. Um, you know, I expect it to be correct, but 
I actually, we tolerate a certain amount of error. When the next step, and this is often where, often when we talk about open, open science, this is when we, we now we're gonna do a publication. And, and here I think about, about, we publish the code, it's a little bit an extended methods because you know we should in the text in English describe what we're doing, but you know English or you know any human language is very imprecise. Um, often you know it doesn't go into all of the details. You might not be specifying all the little choices we make, and so the code helps with that, um, and it helps you know if someone else wants to pick up that work, then you know then it's they have something there. So here, you know, so it needs to be understandable, but we still, we often, often that's, that's there for that paper and maybe for a small number of people who follow up, but it's not gonna be used by, you know, thousands of people out there. So, you know, so for example, if the code is a little bit inflexible or if it requires a lot of, a lot of dependencies, that's okay. That actually, in this case, dependencies are good. Um, and also, you want to fast enough is good enough. So you know, sometimes maybe the code will be actually only be run you know once or twice. Once you analyze your data, you get your figure, you put it in the paper, and if it takes seventeen hours to run, well, you know, maybe you just let it run overnight, and the next day you have your paper, and that's it. Um, the next step, however, and this and most of my talk talks about this, is when we make tools. So we're we're doing software where other people will use, and you know, and we say we plan for success because that means hopefully many people will be using it. And so here, here it's where it's really important to have more, very extensive documentation. You know, we we really want to be sure that you know if we make a mistake in one of our papers, I mean, it's kind of bad, but you know. We probably have made mistakes in our papers, but if we release a tool that causes mistakes in everybody else's papers, that's much much worse. And so, so this is where then we're we're going to bring on all of this machinery of automated checking and you know uh, things that people call continuous integration and etc. And here it's also where you know even small optimizations can be worth it. Um, at the same time. You know, we have to be a little bit careful with dependencies in a way that, because they, they can also bring problems. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. You know, and as a rule of thumb, you know, every time you move up a level, so from one to two and from two to three, that's about 10x more effort. So, so one of the things I, I want you, because I think a lot of people here are probably, most of your code will be in, in groups one and two. And so, you know, sometimes it's good to know about all of the infrastructure that we, that, you know, that you'll hear about, but, you know, maybe it's not worth it for your project. You know, maybe, you know, good enough is good enough. Um, you know, if, you know, if, if the code runs slowly, but, you know, it, it runs in time for you to finish your PhD, maybe that's what you need. Maybe, you know, I think sometimes people worry too much that something is taking half an hour when, you know, when the best thing you can do is just get some coffee in that half hour. And, and for, for example, one thing, and here I'll, I'm, I'm going to be illustrating with a couple of examples from my own work. So, and here I've, I've actually recorded a couple of videos on this, but so we've working on semi bin, which is a tool to bin contigs in metagenomics using semi supervised learning. So if all of those words meant nothing to you, that's, that's okay. It doesn't matter. Let's just say it's a tool that, that we put out there and that we hope people use. So earlier this year, I spent about four days just optimizing the most common usage. Um, and so the code does exactly the same as it did before, except it used to take about 15 minutes and now it takes about five. You know, and, and here the question is, is it worth it? And, you know, so let's say we're planning for success. And so if, so we're gonna be, ambitious and we say, you know what, a thousand other papers will use it and each paper will use it 10 times. So in total, you know, we're gonna save about 70 days of computation. So in this case, it is useful because this is, you know, this is a tool, sorry, this is a tool. Um, okay, 
so there was a message here, but I think it's okay. You can see, I'm gonna assume that you can still see my screen and that you can hear my voice. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so this is, so this is, so this is how we often think about these things is, you know, if, if this thing, if something's going to be used a lot, then it's worthwhile optimizing. Otherwise, I, I see people sometimes very worried that, oh, my code runs so slow, but in fact, maybe your code will be run a very small number of times. And in fact, you know, we often, when we talk about open source software, we think about these big projects, you know, you know, like um, the Linux kernel is sort of the paradigmatic huge project. You know, thousands of people work on it, but that's not actually the most typical. Um, and in science, most projects are actually pretty small. So here you can recognize some of the names. And I'm, so if, so this is actually borrowing a concept from ecology, although on Twitter, people told me that economists actually came up with this first, um, where, where, so I counted, you know, the total number of people that contributed to a project. And so here you can see it, the numbers are not high. And so here are some of my projects, but also things like MegaHit, which is a very, very widely used tool for, for assembly or a tool like Seaborn, uh, which generates plots in, in uh, Python, you know, and if, and, and then I also computed what we call, what I'm going to call the effective number of factors. So in here, you know, for example, Seaborn, I actually, I've contributed a little bug fix to it, but but given, given that there's actually a small number of people that contribute a lot more. And so in this effective number, it's the mathematics, we can talk about it later if you want. It try to capture you know, this intuition that you know, if you have one person that does 99% of the work and then the other 1% is done by you know, 10 other people, in fact, this is, this is a one person project and not really 11 person project. Whereas if you have 11 people and each doing about 9%, then you really have an 11 person project. So you can see that the numbers are quite small with the exception of scikit-learn, which is, which is this, in some ways this incredible success story in attracting a community. And I think one of the reasons too is that scikit-learn is in fact kind of a, a, a meta project. Because what I, what I wanted to, uh, to say is that if even these small projects you so your project is probably going to be a small project it's going to be you um you know during your phd or during postdoctoral studies um maybe your colleagues your colleagues or your close collaborators um but these projects are often acting you know in with other projects that are also open source projects so in so maybe some of you are familiar with you know sort of python and and you have all of these projects, you have NumPy, you have Scikit-Learn, you have Pandas, you have Seaborn, you have Matplotlib. And technically these are all separate projects. Um, technically these, you know, they have their own repositories on GitHub. They, they release, you know, they have different policies, et cetera, et cetera, but they all work together and they form this ecosystem. Uh, ecosystem. So, so and in science, this is often very, very similar where, you know, maybe you're, you're developing a tool that does one little thing, but it, but it's going to be most helpful if it can be integrated into larger pipelines that then also link other tools. And you yourself might probably be using other other people's pipelines and other people's tools. And so and so these things end up forming an ecosystem. Um, and maybe one one important difference in science is that it's it's more important to give credit where credit is due. Uh, so, so maybe we'll come back to that a little bit. And, and so here, I will, I will actually want to encourage you all to, to, you know, to see yourself, you know, you know, you might have your own project, but see yourself as a member of this wider ecosystem where, you know, you, you are, you know, you are reading some package um, and, and there's a documentation and you see, they see a typo or something is wrong. It's badly explained, you know, Feel free to, you know, you should feel free and you should feel free empowered to go and fix it. Or, you know, to contribute things that are not code. And actually here, Veronese, for example, she contributed a Galaxy wrapper to Semibin, you know, and that's also a contribution to the project or in adding testing. And this can and and this can be really this can be really important. And it's also a way of seeing yourself not as just not just as an individual that has a small project, but as someone who's a part of this broader community. You know, and, and as I say, contributions can be code, but they can also be, 
documentations, and even a bug report, which sometimes feels very annoying to have to solve, is actually a really important contribution because if you've run into the bug, probably someone else has run into that as well. And so you can help by fixing not only for yourself, but for the wider community as a whole. And so, and in that I'm gonna, so here, this is the same as I showed before. And so here, I'm just gonna focus now on this screen line. And one of the points is that there's a huge, you know, this started, this is about 2013 and the paper came out in 2019. So that's a full six years. And, um, you know, and again, NGLS, you know, this analyzes NGS data and in particular, we use it for metagenomics, but, you know, but the, the general point is, you know, this is not terribly important. So the, but the question is, why does it take so long? And one of the reasons is it, take, it takes so long to mature because we, we need all of this real experience. And we actually, we need all of these users that, that find all of these weird little uh, corner cases. You know, we, for example, something that actually is, the users seem to be doing something really correctly, um, but the, the system crashed in a weird way. Um, and it turns out that they had a corrupt file, but we had, you know, we, until, you know, until that user came to us with that, you know, it hadn't, it had never occurred to us that, you know, maybe the, the input file could be corrupt in this weird way. Um, but now for every, for everyone else that ever has that problem again, you know, this will be detected and, you know, you, you get an error message because, um, or for example, that, in the first versions, we, there was a slight inconsistency in how you use the tool. This is a, a language and it was not a big deal. You know, we, you know, we had developed, we were using the tool internal, internally, we all knew about this, but when we tried to run a tutorial, we realized that, you know, it was really confusing for people and we had to keep saying, oh yeah, for, for this here, you have to do it this way. But then when you get to this other step, you have to do it a different way. Um, and to have to keep, and, you know, and, and say, oh no, you, now, now you use the method for this thing. It was just confusing. So we ended up fixing that. Um, but the truth is, if we hadn't run a tutorial, you know, we knew all about these details, so we would not have noticed. Um, and and or, or there was here or coming back to what I was saying of being in an ecosystem. So there was a, a bug in another piece of code that we used that gave the correct results. Uh, sorry, gave incorrect results. So in that case, because that dependency was open source, we could actually go into that other project, fix their code, contribute that fix, and then that fixed, you know, that fixed our own tool. Uh, but again, you know, we didn't notice this until the user report. So you need all of, you need a lot of people to, you know, sort of battle test your tools, battle test your tools. And in some ways, every, every user that's that was using these uh, the trial version that, and that was reporting bugs, you know, they were also contributing to our code. Um, maybe I'll give a, another here. We're now looking at the red line. And here again, the red line, you know, it's, here it's a little bit different because there was a, a first release, but then, you know, there was no manuscript for a while. Um, and the truth is that, so I, I wrote this code because I wanted to use it and I've I've actually used it to generate, you know, this plot. I used it to generate the, you know, the that little analysis of with how many effective contributors the project has, and it's actually really, it's really successful in solving my problems. Um, and then, I, although I have to say, you know, I've, I've I'm a little bit disappointed that it has not been particularly successful at attracting users or contributors. It's still mostly all, mostly uh, I think it's a a one point four person project with the one person being me. Um, however, I mean, it's, you know, it, it has, it has solved my problems. Um, I've used it. There's, and there's a couple of derived tools. So a couple of people didn't contribute to the main project, but they built other tools that use it. Um, and so in, and actually in, a, in an ecosystem, it's kind of a little bit hard to say what's a contribution to any particular project because you are contributing often you should think about you're contributing to the ecosystem. So, and sometimes it, maybe it makes more sense to contribute to one, to the main project. Maybe sometimes it makes more sense to, you know, to do a tool that uses that project. And the reasons for that can be, you know, from, from technical, you know, about dependencies and, you know, or different programming languages and styles. It can be, can be about sociological, you know, maybe you, maybe you just really want to work alone or the, or, or it can be about, 
you, you need to define yourself. So, so there's a lot of reasons to that. Um, but, but in the ecosystem, it's sometimes a little bit hard to even to say, okay, the, you know, I said, people, ha not a lot of people contribute to the main project, but the truth is other people have contributed by designing other things, other things. And I think this is my last slide. Um, and, and I've said the word ecosystem a lot because, and I want to, because I want to place it between, you know, so, so there's this sort of say old school type of working where, you know, you you work in this class bubble, your project is you other, um, you know, maybe you and the person sitting next to you in your office and people outside, you know, they're, they're your competitors. They shouldn't know what you're doing because they might scoop you. That's a risk. You don't share any code or data, or if you share, you make them sign a contract and you have, you know, lawyers and et cetera. So that was, you know, that's how, that's how, that's how people, you know, in some, a, a smaller and smaller minority of people do things that way. Um, thank, you know, thankfully, you know, there, there's also this sort of a little bit naive utopian view where, okay, okay. So what we should do is let's just share everything and every, and it, it doesn't matter where you are. Um, and, you know, and both geographically, uh, hierarchically, or, you know, in terms of disciplines, you know, and it doesn't matter who gets credit because, you know, just as long as, you know, the science as a whole is moving forward, you know, that shouldn't matter. Um, but I think, I think we, you know, we, this, this also is not where we are. Um, and, you know, and then maybe we can have a discussion whether we should be there or not. I mean, I, maybe it's not even a particularly good idea. I think where we are is that, is that we are, we're sort of in a reality of, you know, there's an ecosystem. And so the projects are independent. You have all of these that are small, but they are part of this larger ecosystem that interact. And you collaborate in, in this multi-scale way. So maybe you work really closely with a very small number of people, which might be people often you know, that are in the same physical space as you, um, or, you know, and then you loosely co collaborate around the world, you know, when people in other when you, maybe you are making these small contributions, uh, you know, where you fix a bug here, you, you, you add a little piece of documentation there, and, and as much as possible, you try to give credit where credit is due. Uh, you know, it's still, really, it's still really important for people's careers that they be credited with what they've done. So, okay, so in summary, you know, you do think yourself as, you know, as a part of the ecosystem um, that, you know, that all, all the tools that you use, you know, you can potentially change them. You know, basically, the, basically, it's a little bit like, you know, it's a bit like Wikipedia. If there's something wrong, you should be feel empowered to go and change it. Um, you should, and you should think about what's worthwhile for your project, um, and accept that your project is probably going to be a small project. But if it's part of a, this broader ecosystem, you know, that's that's how you end up, you know, you know, being being a you know, leveraging your work and being able to do larger things. So uh, not all contributions need to be code commits and, you know, in credit where credit is due, you know, keep citations, cite the right, cite everyone, everyone. So I, I want to acknowledge um, all of the users that reported bugs and gave feedback and or, or made contributions. Also, there's, you know, this, this was a very personal view, but all of these papers, you know, there's tens and tens of authors there that want to acknowledge that, you know, I didn't do all of this alone, uh, but I didn't want to single any individual out. So, and also finally, I want to thank you and I'm happy to take questions now or feel free to contact me afterwards at any time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, folks, can we have a huge round of applause for Louise? Thank you. Bring the emojis and the um, the silent mute clapping on. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, and for the sake of time, uh, Louise, there are actually a couple of questions, but I wonder if you could just look on the Etherpad and maybe reply to those um, in the Etherpad. I just want to make sure that Alex and Paz have enough time to speak, um, and we've only got 40 minutes left in the call. Um, so the, the uh, questions are line 140 and 142. Um, I'll skip over them for now, but please do check back in the Etherpad in a few minutes, folks, if you want to see answers to those. Uh, okay. So we have one more talk, my friends, and then we'll, we'll do a breakout room uh, so that you don't get too wriggly from sitting in the same spot for a long time. Um, so 
after having talked about research data and code, we're going to talk about managing your projects. So a, a slight um, veer off, but still very uh, re relevant and important. Uh, so Alex, are you around and are you ready? I am around. Let me just remind myself how to share my screen. Make sure I share the right screen. Don't show me my like private email. Hopefully you can see some slides. I see some thumbs up. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's lovely to be back. Lovely to be speaking at OLS again. For those of you who haven't met me before, my name is Alex. I'm a software developer at Welcome Collection, which is a museum and library in London. So I oversee a lot of our digital efforts, our website, and our backend services. And we use agile and iterative product, project management at Welcome. So I'm going to be drawing on some of my own experiences as I talk about this. And what I want to talk about today is really what is agile? Uh, what are these iterative methods? What are they good for? What do you get out of them? And why are they something you might consider using for your project? Uh, and there will be notes and slides available afterwards at the link in the slides, and I'll drop this into the etherpad as well. So the sort of core idea of Agile, I think, is something that many people will be familiar with. It's the idea of iteration. And so I want to jump straight into it. Um, you have some tasks you want to do, some big tasks. So you start by breaking that down into smaller tasks. And that's sort of the smaller, more digestible pieces. And then you actually work through those tasks. Uh, so you're actually doing the work. And this is stuff that I think most people are already pr pretty familiar with. But then the key to join this back up is that you've got to go back and make sure you're reviewing and updating your tasks, that you're constantly reviewing what you're doing, and making sure it's the right it's the right thing to do. And this sort of resonates with some of the stuff Sarah was talking about earlier, that it's not just about doing this once. We're not just planning once and then we're done. We turn planning into a cycle that we're going, to, we're going to be going back and reviewing what we're doing. Uh, that's the bit people often miss, but it's really important. And working in this iterative style gives you a number of benefits. You can react to new information requirements. So you can gather feedback quickly on what you're doing, and you can always be doing something important. So to use an example from my own work, at Welcome Collection, we run a series of in-person events and exhibitions in our venue next door. And in January 2020, my team was planning a big piece of work on how we were going to make events and exhibitions much better on the website. And then March 2020 happened. And all of those plans went out the window. But because we were working in a very iterative style, when we were reviewing our task, we could say, actually, all this work we've got planned around in-person events, let's move that down. That's less important. And let's bring something else in place instead. So working iteratively means you're able to adapt to changing circumstances and pick up new work. So that, that's what iterative development is. Um, so some of you might be thinking at this point, well, big whoop, you've invented the feedback loop. Uh, this is not a new idea. Um, and why is there sort of such a big buzz around this? Because it is something that's definitely, there's been a big buzz, a lot of popularity around it in the last sort of decade or so. And a lot of this buzz is really being driven by the software development industry, which is where I work. And so to understand why some of these ideas seem so exciting, we, we need to understand where they came from. We need to understand the alternative, um, the thing that agile development was a reaction to. And that was a model called Waterfall. So Waterfall is sort of perhaps the more traditional approach to project management. It's a phased project. So, and each phase cannot start until the previous phase is completed. So here, for example, if I'm doing a piece of software development, I would start by getting all of my design, all of my requirements, all of my business analysis, all of that would happen up front, and I would produce a written specification. And this would be a physical printed document, probably several inches thick, that would describe the software in minute detail. The software code programming wouldn't actually start until that spec was written. It gets handed off to the programmers. They then do a bunch of work actually writing all the code. And then that code gets stamped down onto physical disks, which are distributed to users and customers. So we don't really have much of a feedback loop here because this is at a time where it's a lot slower to develop software. Computers aren't as ubiquitous as they are today. And the internet doesn't really exist as a software delivery mechanism. So once you ship your software to users, once it's been sent out on CDs and, and floppy disks, you can't go back and change it. So it's really important to get it right up front um, to do that big upfront design process. But the way we develop software has changed. We have much faster computers. We can ship incremental updates. We can get things out to users much faster. And so this model was increasingly less and less appropriate. 
And so in 2001, a group of software developers came together and they published something called the Agile Software Manifesto. Uh, and this was sort of, this is what has really pushed the use of iterative development in software development teams. It's what really popularized the idea. And it builds on, it, it really is just a reiteration of that core idea, that idea that you make your planning cycle, that you have those faster feedback loops, that you don't build software as a very phased process. Some of this was bringing in some genuinely new ideas, and we'll talk about one of those in a moment. Some of it was a fresh face on all ideas. The idea of iterating on a project is not something that software developers invented in 2001, much as they would like to think so, software developers have not invented everything. One of the ideas that came out of the Agile Manifesto that I think is genuinely quite, quite uh, was quite new and interesting is the idea of something called a minimum viable product. So the idea of this is that if you're iterating on your project, you're working through it in steps, that you should focus on making those steps be useful, measurable pieces. Um, that there should be something you know you can get feedback on that you can re that you can evaluate as you're going along, rather than wait until the very end to get something useful. And so this is almost a cliched diagram of the software, but of, of the genre, sorry, but this is an illustration of uh, how you might do MVP to building wheeled transport. So in the first example, we build a skateboard and then a scooter, a push bike, a motorbike, and a car. And in the second example, we build the wheels, the chassis, the body, and then the car. And so in the first example, you can see all five of these, are, all five steps are useful examples of transport, and we could take them away and we could give them to we could do some research on them, we could measure them, we could get some feedback. In the second example, we don't really have anything we can react to until that final step. So by following an MVP approach, by trying to focus on building useful steps, we can get feedback much faster. And we can even change our direction if we actually get some feedback to go, actually, this isn't really appropriate. Here are two examples. Suppose that we, um, we build our scooter and then we show it to some people and they say, oh, I love this, but I, I really want something that can go up hills. Maybe rather than building a push bike, what we should build is an e-scooter. Or maybe we deliver the motorbike and then people say, actually, this it's a complete flop because what people really wanted was a bike with more carrying capacity. And so we should pivot into cargo bikes. Using an MVP approach, we break our project down and we try to focus on sort of concrete steps, useful, measurable, you know, useful bits at the, out, at the end can often gives us more flexibility and more ability to adapt to changing circumstances. And I use the word product here, product MVP, e product. Product is used in a very general sense. In this example, I'm talking about a physical product, but product could also be a piece of software. It could be some research data. It could be a piece of prose. Um, it's not so much about, you know, what's the actual thing, but it's about making sure that thing is a useful output at every step. So that's MVP and that's a, that's a really good, useful idea. And it means as well that if you get stopped halfway through, you've still got something useful that you're not, um, that you're not waiting till the end for a big bang release. A slightly pithier version of the Agile Manifesto is this phrase, uh, fail fast, fail often. Um, this is quite popular. Um, and this is right, that's sort of, sort of inherent with iterative development, right? You're going to make mistakes, you're going to screw up, but that's how you learn. And that's how you learn, you know, what you should do differently. I include this partly because it's a famous phrase, but partly also to illustrate that waterfall and agile aren't like a better or worse. Um, they're, they're just, they just exist on a spectrum and they're appropriate in different scenarios. It's okay to make lots of mistakes if you are doing something with relatively low stakes, like making a game or a website or maybe a phone app, but maybe it's not the best approach if you are designing an aircraft or a banking system or a drug trial. So iterative development methods have become very popular in the last few years, and I think they're great in a lot of circumstances, but they are not the be all and end all, and Waterfall still very much has a place. So again, that's iterative development. You break down your big tasks into smaller tasks, you work through them, and you do review and update them on a schedule. There are lots of different implementations of this, lots of different approaches to Agile, every team does its process differently, lots of tea ceremony and process that we don't have time to go into today. Um, but if you understand this core idea, this idea that you make it into a cycle, uh, that's a really powerful bit. I do want to give you one example, though, so that it's not just theory, sort of put some concrete, concrete ideas around this. And I want to show you one way that we do it, as this is the way we do it on my team, on one of my teams at Welcome. 
So we use GitHub to track all of our tasks. Uh, we track our tasks using GitHub issues, and then we manage them on this project board. And the board has four columns titled Sprint Backlog, In Progress, Blocked, and Done. And so uh, the sprint is, a, sprint is one of these agile terms, and it means a two-week span of work. So remember I talked about the importance of reviewing your tasks and making sure they're in the right order. Well, that's what sprint enforces for us. At the start of every sprint, we have a planning meeting and we look at all the tickets in this left-hand column. We work out, are they in the right order? And once, what, what are we going to work on for the next two weeks? What's the most important thing for us to be doing? And once we've done that, people can then pick up cards and they gradually move them across the columns in this board. So they'll move them to in progress when they're working on them. It might move to blocked if it's there's some external dependency. Or if not, it goes to done, and then we can take that task off and we move on and they pick up something else. And so we work on these smaller tasks for every for two weeks. And then at the end of the two weeks, when the sprint is over, we come back and we have another planning meeting. And we look back on what we've done, what we've achieved, what we learned in that time, and we'll go back and we'll review the cards in the backlog again. Are these tasks still in the right order? Is there anything we want to add? Anything that's not important anymore? Anything that maybe we want to prioritize higher or alternatively move down the backlog. So the sprint gives us a mechanism for doing this. And this is called a Kanban board where you're tracking your tasks as sort of little cards and you move them from left to right across the board. And then to give you a brief example of how we might break down a task, um, I'm gonna show you sort of, we recently had to do a new homepage design. So, so that's obviously a big task. The way we broke it down was creating some design mockups, implementing those designs in code. So that's you know, a developer going away and writing the code. Then there's a stage of reviewing the new homepage. Um, and then at this point, right, there's a fork in the process. We could, if the review is great, then we could move on and deploy it to all our users. Or we could say, actually, it needs some more work. It needs to go back to the designer or the developer. So we're able to react to it. We're able to react to it. But let's say we deploy the new version, that would become a new ticket. And then we might have another ticket for another task for gathering feedback from users. And that in turn could create even more tasks if depending on what the feedback is. And again, we prioritize that and decide, okay, what feedback is important that we need to address quickly and what feedback actually we'll get to at some point, but it's not so important. So that's how we break down tasks. And so this is sort of a slightly abstract version. So I offer this to you as an agile starter kit. Uh, you just start off with a board with three columns to do in progress and done. You write your task on little post-it notes, break them down, and then put something in your schedule. I just put Monday mornings here, for example, where you just go through and review all the tasks and to do and make sure they're still appropriate, make sure they're still correct. And as you go along, you move tasks into the in-progress column and then into the done column. And that's how you track what you're working on at a particular time and what's being completed. And so, and then again, you'll come back and continue to review these to-do tasks. And this is a really simple implementation called Kanban. It can get much more complicated than this. There are much more, many more procedures and processes you can learn, but this is sort of the simplest, this is one of the simplest implementations of it. And again, it's all building around this key idea. Break down your big tasks into smaller tasks, work through those smaller tasks, and then review and update the plan on a regular schedule. That is a very brief whistle stop tour of agile and iterative methods. I hope that's been interesting. I hope you've learned sort of, you've got a better idea of it now. Um, like I said, I'll put slides and notes up shortly. Also happy to answer questions now, or if we're short of time in the chat, or get in touch with me separately. But yeah, that is a very whistle-stop tour of Agile and project management. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, folks, please uh, br bring in the big claps and the emoji reactions. Um, thank you, Alex, we really appreciate. And the one thing I love is that each time I see you give a talk, it's different and it's really insightful. Uh, so really, thank you so much. Um, so I think, again, just keeping an eye on the time uh, that we will uh, ask if there's any questions that they go in the etherpad. Uh, so folks, if you have any questions or comments for Alex, line 161 is the place to put it. Um, I'm going to just add a note and a thanks actually both to Alex and Louise, uh, that whilst you're both talking about software-y things, I think you put a lot of effort into making sure that people could recognize how these techniques and tools could work even for people who don't write code on a regular basis. Um, and OLS is definitely not only about Curtis, so thank you both for that. Um, so next, we have a breakout room, my friends. Um, so we just uh, want to talk a little bit about it. 
we're, we're getting tongue tied there. Iterative uh, project management and design um, in groups. So Pauline, uh, I'm just going to suggest if you haven't already started to try and break up people into written or spoken rooms in the background while I discuss what's going on. Um, so the idea is having listened to a couple of these talks, think about your RLS uh, project, think what you might want to do. If you have a few next steps, how do you break those down into chunks that you can make them then uh, tackleable? And maybe even if you're feeling confident, you could put those on a GitHub project board so that people uh, who come along and want to see what you're doing can see some of the roadmap for what you're working on. Um, and if you're not working on something um, full time, if it's a side project, your sprint might not be two weeks. It might be that actually you examine it once a month or less frequently. Um, so remember that you, you do things in the speed that you can and it doesn't have to match what other people do. Um, back yet. Um, I think, oh yeah, we're all back. Uh, so folks, I know that I went into the room with Dario and I was like, oh, I think I wish I need more time to think about this, uh, how it might apply to my project, for example. Um, and sometimes I think also people may be working in very iterative ways, but not necessarily realize that that's what they're doing as well. Um, <laughs> But I'm going to, yeah, if, if you have any thoughts or questions that you'd like to share, I'll invite you to write those in the etherpad or write them in the chat. Um, but for now, Paz is kindly going to give us the final talk of the day, which is about open hardware. And I like that you've set up your background, Paz. Paz, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to try to make it shorter uh, so we can have some time to make direct questions to the to Sada and, and, and yeah, so sorry if I if I run while I talk. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna share the screen. Um, da -da -ding. So <laughs> sorry, this is okay. Good. Do you see well? It looks good. Okay, any uh, slides, but very short ones. Okay, so uh, first of all, like uh, for the people here, there are very good talks from previous cohorts about open science hardware. So I recommend everyone to go check them, them out if they have time, they're not long. Uh, so what is open science hardware? Um, what am I looking at? Okay. Uh, so yeah, tools, <laughs> tools to make science, um, equipment to make science. Um, yeah, that is, but open, open. And that means uh, that they can uh, be more affordable, that can be repairable, adaptable. I use the word adaptable and not the one in, in you know, next to it, because I cannot pronounce it. It's very hard <laughs> for me. Uh, and someone has the mic open, I think. Is I've I've used see? my mute powers. Okay, nice. And so, and that is a is a hardware that can be reproducible. And and that for that to happen, um, lots of things are needed. Uh, one of them is documentation. I'm just gonna put an emphasis on that. Um. One example that was mentioned by by previous uh, in previous uh, calls has been the Open Flexure uh, project, uh, and it actually was the first um, piece of open hardware that I, I I I made or I tried to with a bunch of people because we failed, and we failed because the documentation wasn't wasn't good enough. That was in 2017, so a lot has happened since then, um, and it is a it is an amazing project. Um, but yeah, so I, I wanted to put it here because it was the first one and I had a lot of fun. It was an amazing first experience with open science hardware. And it is less than hundred dollars if I'm not wrong. I didn't check that in the website, uh, but someone else said that. And I believe this is probably very cheap uh, compared to the other microscopes that are often bought by universities or research centers uh, everywhere else. And, and they're so cute now. So they're like Legos as well, like Legos. Um, 
And like, I, I can believe the price of Legos. I, I wanted to check and <laughs> how expensive they are. So really like, it's better to buy one, you know, an upward flexure if you want to play, <laughs> I guess. Um, and so the opposite to, um, to open science hardware is, is often described as a black box, is equipment that you cannot open and you cannot, I mean, actually open and see how it works. Uh, and that means that you cannot, you probably don't know how it works and, and, and what things don't work and you cannot make it good enough for your context, uh, which is probably, I mean, if you don't live in the country where it was built, uh, it might mean that the hardware is not gonna work uh, well enough or it might go, it might break or the humidity in your country might kill it. Anyways, many, many reasons. Um, so it's just an example. This was from 2017 and it's in Spanish, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's a website of one of the public uh, research institutions. And they are so proud of having bought a, a microscope that was like $12,000. And I wonder how researchers that make a lot less than that per year in salary would feel like using the microscope, like that is a hundred dollars, like $1,200, um, $12,000, um, it's scary at least. Um, but one thing I wanted to notice, sorry, this is, this is in Spanish, but they, they add the price there. Um, that is in Argentina, Argentinian pesos. So um, I wanted to, to emphasize that the narrative is still very much, um, this was from 2017, but this is still the case right now. The narrative very much is like, uh, if it's built in the global north, it's good. If it's built by a big company, it's quality. Um, and that's something that uh, open science communities need to fight uh, consciously, um, kind of changing that narrative. So I don't know, maybe uh, really, you know, like getting, becoming friends with people that write these articles or something like that. Uh, yeah, the, the one in that photo, for example, that is from this year. Uh, it doesn't co cost that much as the other one, but still, you know, that the researchers here in Argentina, at least, I mean, often earn, I don't know, a third of that per month uh, with luck. So anyways, so I wanted to show a video, but I want to shift the time and it's, it's not much time. So I'm going to uh, click on it anyways, um, because I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the project that I work on. Um, uh, the open science hardware project that I work on from 2017 to 2019. It's not a dead project, but the pandemic made it difficult. Um, so I'm just going to put this video because it has subtitles in English. So, and, and I need a bit of music because I'm sleepy still. The... Can you maybe make it big? I, also, I don't know if we hear it. Okay. Yeah. Wait. So, uh, do, 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 here. Oh, you can just watch it, but it's um, three minutes. So, yeah, uh, let's watch a bit, not the whole thing.
I think you're speaking, but you're muted. Yeah, uh, I don't know how to go back to the slides. Well, how should I do that? <laughs> Wait, one second. Um, okay, so, um, oh, there is so little time. Um, what I wanted to, I mean, I wanted to put that video because one of the things uh, open, open science hardware, I think, allowed, allowed us to do, um, I don't consider myself a, a, a academic. I mean, I'm not part of the academia, I've never been. So what allows scientists and non-scientists to do, sorry, I, I'm not using this, okay, um, is, uh, is maybe a, a more clear need uh, to kind of collaborate with many others that aren't scientists. Uh, this video that, that video you saw, it was that I was a bunch of people, scientists from different countries and a local community that we have been working with for, for a few months in, in, in copying that drone and repl replicating it. Uh, it was not our, our design. Then we modified it. Uh, but uh, what, I, what we learned is that um, it, there is a huge space for that type of collaboration. Anyway, so I wanted to uh, keep you, I mean, um, uh, let leave you with um, some questions like from your own uh, experience and where you're based and um, like how do you see that collaboration with with local communities and around tools for science uh, do you see it possible do you see it like as a needed thing and I had another example but we have three minutes and we need to close so um, I might record the, the bit that is couldn't cover and in another video and then yeah, mix it with the this video um, if you, you you think that would be good um, yeah, but yeah so let's go not not enough time to for questions so sorry pass. Thank you very much. Um, I think you raised some new new points that we've not had in our open science um, hardware talks before. Uh, folks, huge round of applause for Paz as well. We're sorry you ran out of time as well. <laughs> no, that <laughs> doesn't matter. I have the privilege of like to see. being able to put the video as well, so that's fine. When I'm more awake. I know. Thank you so much for getting up so early in Argentina to come to talk to us. <laughs> um, folks, if there are any questions about open hardware, um, I'm going to suggest to either pop them in the etherpad or um, you know where to find us in Slack. Um, and we, we always have Paz handy and uh, to talk about her amazing open hardware experience. And I, I just want to go and do that drone now. It looks so cool. Um, we have a few assignments that come from week to week, um, talking about things like the GitHub, GitHub files that we spoke in the last couple of calls. Notes for those right now are in the Etherpad online 238, and we'll also email reminders, or remember if you've created your GitHub issue, that that has a checklist with things that you need to be doing each week that can help you remind what, what's going on. Um, we know that there's a lot, and that you may not always be able to keep up with all of the things. Um, but if you're, if you're stuck, don't, don't despair. You're still welcome here, even if you haven't completed all of the assignments. They're for you to help yourself out um, and that you won't get banned or in trouble or kicked out of OLS because you don't have enough time to do all these things. Um, next week, we have a mentor-mentee call. And then the week after, we have a cohort call on community design for inclusivity. Uh, and if anyone wants to offer any feedback on the call, right at the bottom of the etherpad, we have questions about what worked, what didn't work, what you change, and what surprised you. Um, but I think we're going to wrap up and have a beautiful day, everyone. Thank you for coming to the call and participating so honestly. Thank you, Sada. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Oh, wait, before you go, no, wait. Uh, so remember there are co-work cafeterias this weekend, co-working sessions for GitHub. So yeah, we have this online cafeteria now, Sara, um, which uh, we have the first session this week. Um, 
no session, be, we, we, blah, yeah, just a place, online place to chill and just have a coffee or whatever. So please come. <laughs> uh, can I find like instructions how to join in the Etherpad or how does it work? I mean, yeah, yeah, if you, if you want, yeah, uh, I'll send you the details, but yeah, welcome, welcome everyone to come. Thanks all, bye. Hi. Bye all.